Well, good morning again. Um, when Dave and Debbie and I were cleaning out Al's house that he left us after he passed, we found a bunch of sermons that had been delivered by a Reverend Bruce Clear. He was the minister at All Souls Unitarian Church in Indianapolis, Indiana, and he gave the service on March 8, 1998. And I think it's, a, it's about appropriate today as it was back then, which is quite something when you think about it. William Ellery Channing, one of the most popular preachers in his day, refused to publish his sermon titles ahead of time. His original, I'm sorry, I should say, his original title for this was A Religious View of the Constitution and a Constitutional View of Religion. At one time, Mr. Channing did so, Reverend, but he, and, but he told the story of why and when that changed. One Sunday morning, he was walking across the Boston Common on his way to his pulpit at the Federal Street Church. He happened to cross a member of his congregation heading in the opposite direction. When they met, the parishioner explained that he'd read a notice of the sermon topic and he decided he wasn't interested. Channing was pleasant, of course, but from that day forward, he determined never again to announce the topic beforehand. <laughs> so that topic, that story came to my mind as I pondered about this morning on the longest <coughs> sermon title I've ever had. Added to that, that the fact that the topic of the Constitution sounds pretty dry, even to me. I have visions of passing the entire congregation going the opposite way. And thanks for sticking around, guys. The fact is that the Constitution may perhaps be the most important document we have concerning religion, if for no other reason than in this country, the Constitution defines the boundaries and the power of religion. It is not, of course, a religious document in any traditional sense, though I've often heard the mistaken claim that the Constitution created a Christian America. One misconception about the Constitution is that it is filled with explicitly religious language. While it is true that the Declaration of Independence refers to the Creator and Providence and so forth, the word God or any other euphemism referring to God does not appear in the Constitution. The word religion appears only twice. Once when it says that there shall be no religious test for holding public office. And second, in the First Amendment, which guarantees religious freedom and separation of church and state. Yet, there is religion surrounding the Constitution. It is not the religion of creed, nor is it the religion of churches. It is what some historians called the religion of the American Enlightenment. The most common religious view of the leading founders of this country was deism. You don't hear much about deism these days, but it's helpful to understand it to get a perspective on the religious context of the Constitution. Deism is a belief that in God the creator and sustainer of life, but certainly not God the Father or God the Judge. Deism is distinguished from theism in this way. Does God intervene in human affairs? Can we call upon God to help us get out of a jam or fix something that is wrong? Theism says yes. God is in fact a person who acts in human history, who hears and answers prayer, who judges, condemns, and rewards human behavior. The deist, the deist, I'm not quite sure how to say it, says no. To the deist, God is the creator and little else. It is God who set the world in motion, who designed the laws of nature and the moral rules of behavior, but having begun the vast cosmic system, does not interfere as that system unfolds. Now that was interesting to me because I hadn't really understood that distinction there before. Natural law is the most important source for understanding the universe designed by God. Enlightenment thinkers had a deep faith in science as a revealer of truth, confident that nature operated by discoverable laws rather than by the fiat or the will of a divine ruler. This is why it was not unusual for enlightenment people to do the kinds of things Jefferson did. He measured temperature several times a day, recorded rainfall over long periods of time, 
studied genealogy to determine life expectancy of generations, and he even tried to discover the mathematical formula for happiness. But natural law did not just govern nature, it also governed human affairs, so that Enlightenment believers were confident in a science of government, for example, a government that is consistent with the way nature works. That faith is reflected in the Constitution we inherited from them. This is the religious context in which the Constitution arose, and it is the context that helps inform us about the relationship between religion and our Constitution. The most significant thing that the Constitution says about how government and religion should relate is that they shouldn't. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free establishment there, the free exercise thereof. In the words of Jefferson, this language from the First Amendment was to erect a wall of separation between church and state. It is error alone, said Jefferson, which needs the support of government. Truth can stand by itself. And I would mention there was something in the news this week, I don't remember now who it was, one of the upper echelon Republican senators, or Congress people anyway, who said that he followed Jefferson because he thought Jefferson conflated the two, you know, religion and government, and said that they should be reflected, and he was pretty quickly shut down by people saying, no, Jefferson's the one who proposed the First Amendment. Radical as it was, the system of separation of church and state was widely accepted, and it was accepted for reasons arising from the origin of the, Amer the religion of the American Enlightenment. For the remainder of my comments, I would like to look at this relationship between religion and the Constitution through Unitarian eyes. We will see, I think, that the principles behind the Constitution share a great deal with the principles that guide our religious tradition. Unitarian and the, Unitarianism and the Constitution are two very different roads, one religious and the other political. The Constitution gives direction and guidance to our society. Unitarianism gives direction to our spirit. There are, I believe, however, a number of points in which these two roads intersect. What I will do with the remainder of my time is examine some of these points in intersection. First of all, it should be noted that our Constitution was written by people who had the profound confidence in science and reason. The spirit of their age was the scientific spirit, scientific in this sense. They had deep faith in our ability to create a society consistent with the laws of nature. The Constitution, which makes no reference to a deity, was the first great attempt to create a just society without trying to create a theocracy. To do this, they firmly believed in following a scientific approach to human relations. Today we look back at their time and their science, if anything, appears quaint. But in their minds, it was science and reason that were guiding their ideas. Unitarianism and universalism in this country were born out of exactly the same spirit, confidence and enthusiasm for science and religion. What the founders did for the science of politics, Unitarians and Universalists attempted to do for the science of religion as they saw it. Indeed, some of the same act people were active in both endeavors. From the very beginning in this country, both Unitarians and Universalists were trying to construct what they called a natural theology, a religion that could be supported by the conclusions of reason and the evidence of science, a religion whose truth could be accepted not just by scripture, but more importantly by natural laws. In both cases, for politics as well as for religion, the idea of shaping a rational and scientific foundation came essentially from Europe, from thinkers like John Locke, who said, on the one hand, it is natural for people to rule themselves and make their own laws, rather than to be ruled by sovereign authority. And on the other hand, he said, that God operates within the laws of nature, not in spite of them. Today, I suppose, we have less optimism about the scientific nature of either politics or religion. Because the more we learn about science, and especially about social sciences, we, more, we become humbled by the complexity of it all. But we do not have less commitment to making society and religion rational. 
A second point of intersection between constitutional principles and Unitarianism is the attitude of each toward the integrity of the individual. Most comments I've seen about the Constitution do a fairly good job of pointing out that the purpose of that document was not so much to create a government as it was to define the limits of that government. I want to repeat that because I think that's so important. Most comments I have seen about the Constitution do a fairly good job of pointing out that the purpose of that document was not so much to create a government as it was to define the limits of that government. This is especially true for the Bill of Rights, which wasn't adopted till much later. And the reason for restricting government was quite simply to ensure the rights of individuals. The government was to serve the citizen and not the other way around. This principle of respect for the integrity of the individual is easy for people to understand and affirm abstractly, but sometimes very difficult for people to accept in practice. Perhaps the best example of that is the way in which our government is supposed to treat criminal suspects. Ever since the Supreme Court adopted the Miranda Rule, that individuals must be advised of their rights at the time of arrest, people have complained about the coddling of criminals by this rule. But what is this rule? if not, it is not the implementation of the principle behind the Constitution, which says the government shall respect the integrity and the dignity of the individual. This constitutional principle of the dignity of the individual intersects with the somewhat radical Unitarian principle of individual worth. Our commitment as a religion to this principle is so extreme and so unusual that we, alone among all religions that I know about, teach that it is more important for people to follow their own conscience in matters of religious belief than it is for them to be right in their beliefs. This principle is so key to our religion that when we adopted a new statement of principles some years ago, the very first one on the list of our shared values is to affirm and promote the worth and dignity of every person. I ran across an interesting statement I'd like to share with you. It's from David Lithenall in 1947. It was from a confirmation hearing when he was nominated to be head of the Atomic Energy Commission. I believe the Constitution of the United States to rest, as does religion, upon the fundamental proposition of the integrity of the individual and that all government and private institutions must be designed to promote and protect and defend the integrity and the dignity of the individual. That is the essential meaning of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and it is essentially the meaning of religion. All government and private institutions must be designed to promote and defend the integrity and the dignity of the individual. It doesn't feel like we've been living through that lately, I have to say. A third important intersection between the constitutional principles and Unitarianism is that they both value or claim to value diversity of thought. Thomas Jefferson, one architect of this nation and a Unitarian, yay, offered a comment that gives one reason to pause. As the Creator has made no two faces alike, so also no two minds, and probably no two creeds. Differences of opinion like differences of face, are a law of nature and should be viewed with the same tolerance. If you were to say that today, the image of treating different faces with tolerance is an intriguing one for me, Reverend Clear says. The founders believed that freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, freedom of belief to, uh, to be demanded by nature itself. Freedom, they thought, is the only scientific approach to political relations. Many feared diversity of opinion because they felt it would lead to error, but the founders had a deep faith that diversity of belief was the surest road to truth. If people disagree, so much the better, because truth will be revealed or discovered in the process of disagreement. Difference of opinion, said Jefferson, leads to inquiry, an inquiry to truth. Unitarians applied the same principle for religion, 
arguing that freedom of belief is far more reliable and just than any creed. If there is any truth in a creed, that truth has nothing to fear from disagreement. In fact, truth is more secure whenever it can be tested in the free marketplace of ideas. As a consequence, Unitarians from the beginning devalued diversity of belief within its congregations. It wasn't always easy to do, and it still isn't, but it is the only honest and respectful approach to truth. Jefferson also believed this about religion. He said, is, is uniformity of opinion in religion desirable? No more than uniformity of a person's face and stature. Introduce the bed of proscute. I should have looked this up, Proscutus then, and as there is danger that many large men may beat the small, make us all of a size by lopping the former and stretching the latter. Difference of opinion is advantageous in religion. It does me no injury for my neighbor to say that there are 20 gods or no god. It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my legs. From all the commentaries I have seen about the Constitution, I have come to the conclusion that the most important section of the Constitution, even more important than the First Amendment, is Article 5, Amendments. <coughs> if it were not for this article, the entire document should be vilified rather than celebrated. If Article 5 did not exist, we would be one of the most repressive societies on the face of the earth. Slavery would still exist, women would have no citizenship rights, and states could violate the Bill of Rights at will. The Constitution was flawed, inhumanely flawed, but because of Article 5, which allows for amendments, it was not irreparably flawed. And that is why, to my mind, Article 5 is the most important provision in the Constitution. For many of the framers, the provision for amendments was a pragmatic decision. It made ratification more likely if people knew the document could be changed. But for some of the founders, in the, the provision for amendments was a matter of principle, a deeply held conviction that as society changes our, changes, our rules for governing society must also change. They did not see themselves as, as infallible in the sense that many today perceive them as being infallible. The prospect of changing conditions or changing their minds did not frighten or disturb them. They expected such changes. The inclusion of a principle for amendments demonstrated that they trusted future generations. This provision for amendments represents a fourth intersection between constitutional principles and Unitarian principles. Unitarianism has never been a religion which prides in being the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Quite the contrary, Unitarianism at its best is an evolving and transforming religion. Most religions cling proudly to the claim that their beliefs haven't changed over the centuries, that while they may modernize their methods, their creeds are the same as they were a thousand years ago. I could understand the appeal of that claim. But Unitarianism can make no such claim, nor does it wish to. The belief of most Unitarians today are startling differently, different from the beliefs of most Unitarians at the time of the American Revolution, and even different from Unitarians only a generation ago. What hasn't changed is the underlying principle that progress in anything, including religion, means change. Unitarian is one of the few religions I know that has as a part of its philosophy an Article 5, a provision for amendment and expectation of amendment. As it was with the Constitution, so it is also with Unitarianism, that the openness to amendment and change indicates a trust in future generations. Thomas Jefferson and John Adams were both Unitarians, though they were also strong political opponents. Only in retirement did they become close friends. They still disagreed strongly about politics, but they developed one of the most memorable bonds of friendship in American history. As their friendship developed after each of them had served as president, Jefferson wrote the following to Adams in 1813. A constitution has been acquired which, though neither of us thinks is perfect, yet both consider as competent 
to render our fellow citizens the happiest and securest upon which the sun has ever shone. If we do not think exactly alike as to its imperfections, it matters little to our country, which, after devoting to it long lives of disinterested labor, we have delivered over to our successors in life, who will be able to take care of it and of themselves. These are what I see as the major intersections between principles of the Constitution and principles of the Unitarianism. I'll close with a couple of comments about how these principles are approached. It is sometimes said that Unitarianism is not a religion of belief, but rather a religion of process. Not a religion of belief, but rather a religion of process. There is a lot of truth to that claim. Our faith is really not in any specific metaphysical system, but our faith is in a religious process of open inquiry and rational judgment. Likewise, I suggest that what the Constitu country honors in its Constitution is not what the Constitution says, but the process the Constitution affirms. It is a process of democratic rule with power in we the people. And regardless of how oppressive the content of that Constitution can be and has been, the process it affirms is, in the end, more significant than the specific content. Another comment about process concerns interpretation of the Constitution. And here I ask you, I may tread on more controversial ground. I ask you to consider for a moment the historic Unitarian approach to the Bible. Unitarianism has long claimed an unusual and controversial approach to the Bible. From the beginning, Unitarians have suggested that it is the principles behind the text of the Bible that are important. Literal interpretations are beside the point. The original meaning of the authors is beside the point. The Bible lays out some very, ma very major principles of living, and those principles are applied differently today because circumstances are different today than they were 2,000 years ago. The proper task is to remain true to the principles behind the text. This, I might suggest, also makes sense to me as to how the Constitution should be interpreted. Some argue that the court should look only to the original meaning or the original intent of the authors, and any interpretation outside that original meaning is not justified. To me, that misses the point. There are important principles behind the text of the Constitution, some of which I mentioned, and our task of interpretation is to imply those principles to today's circumstances. My final comment about process is that this, the constitutional system does not work by magic. It is a piece of paper and nothing more, unless the people are committed to the principles behind it. This is a trembling and sometimes frightening thought, but the Constitution means nothing if the people don't support it. It is frightening especially when we consider widespread misunderstanding about it and the fact that our governments are always elected by a miserably small minority of citizens who are elect eligible to vote. And we're still having that as an issue. In preparing for my comments this morning, I was surprised to discover that William Ellery Channing, who founded the American Unitarian Movement, had a great deal to say with the Constitution. I'll close with some of his wisdom. Writing in 1830, he said, our great error as a people is that we put an idolatrous trust in our free institutions, as if these, by some magic power, must secure our rights, however we enslave ourselves to evil passions. We need to learn that the forms of liberty are not its essence, that while the letter of a free constitution is preserved, its spirit may be lost, and that even its wisest provisions and most guarded powers may be made weapons of tyranny. The great distinction of a nation, the only one worth possessing and which brings after it all other blessings, is the prevalence of pure principle among its citizens. Of this country, I may say with peculiar emphasis that its happiness is bound up in its virtue.